Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from Marion Gaston. What we say matters. As judges, we are uniquely positioned to influence the lives of the people who appear before us, for better or worse, and the words we choose make a difference. Today, I will be addressing how we as judges can talk to the people we see in court in a way that improves outcomes. The technique I recommend, motivational interviewing, decreases recidivism rates, it costs nothing, and it demonstrates the court's appreciation for the dignity of every human being coming before it. So first, some background. Since the first drug court in the United States opened in 1989, drug courts have spread like wildfire. Drug courts operate using a collaborative model, a team model, and they incorporate regular hearings that decrease over time as the participant makes progress. They use phases through graduation. They provide additional support and services for participants and additional scrutiny and immediate proportionate sanctions for violations. There are now thousands of drug courts throughout the United States and the world, and we've heard today from my esteemed colleagues that the collaborative court principles are now used in different types of courts, addressing mental health, veterans, sex trafficking and children's issues, including my sex trafficking court in San Diego, California, and my child abuse and neglect court. In San Diego, we also have a collaborative court that supervises hundreds of convicted felons who have been released into the community with very impressive results. The recidivism rate for this population is only about 15%, much lower than similar groups of offenders whose cases are not handled using these collaborative principles. Also, since the 1980s, multiple studies have been done examining drug courts, and we now know what works. The National Association of Drug Court Pro Professionals, I've provided the link here in this slide. The National Association of Drug Court Professionals has produced a very lengthy and free report available online that identifies the 10 best practices that separate the most effective drug courts from those that are not as successful. And I encourage you to look at the 10 best practices identified online. Today I will be focusing really on best practice number three, having the right judge for your court or more precisely, how to be the right judge who can support and encourage change regardless of the court where you preside. First, we know that the amount of time that a judge spends with each participant matters. At three to four minutes of interaction, we begin to see improvements. We know that we see dramatic improvements in recidivism rates, and in addition, our research tells us that the quality of the interaction between participant and judge makes a difference. It's not just the time. How we talk to the people who appear before us matters. Successful participants tell us that they believe that their interactions with judges were part of their success. Research shows better outcomes for participants whose judges were scored by independent raters as being respectful fair, attentive, supportive, and not shaming and not hostile. So we know to spend some time talking with the people who appear before us, and we know that we get better outcomes if we are, we are seen as respectful and fair. More recent research supports the use of motivational interviewing to take our courts to the next level. This is a technique for communicating with those who come before the court. It's a method that respects the dignity of those we see, acknowledges that they have free will, and allows them to make decisions for themselves. So what is motivational interviewing? It's a way of communicating about change. This starts from the premise that a person will work harder and make more lasting change when they choose to do it. It recognizes that change is driven by motivation 
and not information. If you think about the temptations that you face in your own life, you will know that this is true. When we eat that second bowl of ice cream or have a second piece of cake, it's not because we don't know that the second piece is bad for us. What we lack isn't education, it's motivation. Some might ask, why not just tell the people who come before our courts what to do and lock them up if they don't do it? Because it doesn't work. Worldwide efforts to arrest and incarcerate our way out of addiction and mental illness haven't solved the problem. And they've made matters worse by depleting scarce resources and redirecting those resources to prisons instead of programs in our communities. Also, while it is true that we can successfully change someone's behavior by threatening them, temporary compliance is not the same thing as long-term behavior change. If we want stronger, safer communities, if we want the people who appear before us to be freed from their misery, to live happier, healthier lives, we must do something differently. Research shows that we can get better outcomes if instead of using a traditional way of talking, a directive approach, we use a motivational approach. With a directive approach, we tell a person what their problem is. We tell them how to fix it. We talk. With a motivational approach, we ask the person what they think they need to succeed, and we listen. An example of a directive approach would be to tell someone, you need to get this program done, no excuse. While a motivational approach might instead ask, how would things be better if you finished this program? Using a directive approach, a judge may say to someone, you aren't enrolled in this program because you haven't called. A motivational judge might ask instead, what could you do to get enrolled? A directive approach might have us telling a young woman, if you stay with this boyfriend, you are going to relapse. A motivational approach may find us saying instead, how do you think your life would be different if you weren't with him? Note, these are open-ended questions that actually require that we listen to the answer. So here are some tips how to implement motivational interviewing effectively. First, consider the compliment sandwich. Start by pointing out something that the person is doing right and end with praise as well. For example, you could say, Mr. Martinez, I see that you have a new job. Things are going well there and you've been making drug treatment appointments. Congratulations. On the other hand, I noticed that you missed some drug tests last week and we need to talk about that. Then you can close with something positive, like keep up the good work with your drug treatment. Research tells us that when people are frightened or angry, it is very difficult for them to hear anything we say. Starting positive can help put the participant's mind at ease so that they can hear what we say next. It also begins and ends a court session on a positive tone and shows them that you see what they're doing right, that you're paying attention as an ally who wants them to succeed. Acknowledge the person's feelings. Just like us, the people before us have days when they're tired, overwhelmed, or sad. And just like us, they want to be seen. If a person is obviously angry, it can be helpful simply to say, I see that you're angry. If someone says they're frustrated, you can say, I'm sorry you're frustrated. As with the compliment sandwich, when we point out what a participant is doing right, we show that we're paying attention. We see the person standing before us and we want their success. Acknowledging the person's feelings includes acknowledging feelings about ambivalence, about change. This is normal and is an expected part of progress. Remember, we are usually asking participants to give up something, something that made them feel good, even temporarily, maybe a drug or a relationship, or even just the freedom to lash out when they're angry. So instead of arguing with someone about how doing drug treatment or therapy would be good for them, we can acknowledge that change is hard and that we know that we're asking them to give up something that's been a part of their lives. The mental health professionals who do this work encourage us to envision this as two doors. 
We can say on the one hand, you don't want to go to this program because you don't think it will help. On the other hand, you do think there's a problem. Or you don't think it's fair that you've been ordered to do these classes. On the other hand, you do want this case over with. We can validate that the person before us con is conflicted while encouraging them to make the best decision for themselves and their family and walk through the better door. Fourth, and this is fun, you can fantasize about the future with the person appearing in front of you. This works particularly well when someone resists being labeled an alcoholic or addict. Instead of telling someone that they are obviously an addict in need of sobriety, we can ask, how would your life be better if you didn't use methamphetamine? Instead of telling someone that anyone arrested six times for drink, drinking and driving is, of course, an alcoholic, we can ask, how would your mother feel if you stopped drinking? Instead of telling someone that they just need to do what they're told, we can ask them to imagine, imagine that it's two years from now, and you're clean and sober and out of the system. How did you get there? Again, this recognizes that the person in front of you has agency. This is their life, they have to live it, and they own the outcomes, good or bad. Point out success. Many people coming before the court haven't received a lot of praise in their lives. You can say to them, you've been sober for 30 days, how did you do that? I hear that you don't like someone in your program, but you're keeping out of trouble. What does it say about you that you're able to do that? You're doing a great job. What advice would you give to someone who's new to this program? I see that you were sober from 2014 to 2016. What were you doing then that worked? What would you say that you're good at? What would your program leaders say that you're good at? Each of these gives the, op the participant an opportunity to point out something that they know that they are doing well. Brainstorm next steps. You can say, I have some ideas about what I think might work, but I'd like to hear from you. Do you think it would work if? What do you think would work? And note, in each of these interactions, we're asking real open questions. We want to know what the participant has to say. We're not asking fake open questions, like don't you want to be sober? Aren't you tired of this? or what were you thinking going to that party? Finally, we're going to emphasize choice. We let the participants before us know that this is absolutely their decision. We can say, here's what will happen if you don't go to this program or if you don't meet with your probation officer. But ultimately, it's your choice. You have control over this. What do you think you'll do? I highly recommend trying these methods. They are simple but effective with the youth and the parents that I work with on a daily basis, and they have the benefit of being absolutely free. Anyone can start next week. By engaging empathetically with participants, we're allowing them true access to justice, regardless of gender, age, minority status, or lack of privilege, and we are using cutting edge proven techniques. Both access to justice and advancement of judicial best practices are values of the National Association of Women Judges and the International Association of Women Judges. In this setting, I would be remiss if I did not point out that motivational interviewing also reflects the values of the Roman Catholic Church, which teaches that God created all of us as rational beings deserving of respect and conferred with free will and dignity. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Gaston.